And with your expertise, how do you think that we can support those that are, you know, are most vulnerable during this time? Like you said, the Prophet was going through so many difficult times himself, and yet he still was very much there for his community. And I guess we have to kind of do the same, really. Yeah, and I think from a testing situation as well, when you're put in, you also realise how really, you know, how resilient you are and how yeah. strong you are. You're listening to Sunnah's Dream, a podcast exploring the prophetic way. Assalamu alaikum, you are joining Sunnah Stream. My name is Saira and I'm joined today by two really special people, um, Tijen um, from Muslim Hands and also um, Safia from Inspirited Minds. And this is actually our first podcast actually talking about mental health. And we really wanted to explore this because... Um, you know, this week we actually were talking about Mental Health Day. Um, the theme is making mental health and well-being a global priority. And as the economic crisis takes over and very much um, in our lives and we're all worrying about something, you know, Muslim Hands has been running um, open kitchens for the past two years. And we've been able to meet beneficiaries that have shared their stories about their struggle financially and just how the new wave of the economic crisis is really impacting them. And so we wanted to speak about just how we can overcome any anxiety that we're feeling this time, if there's any tips or things that we can explore and just about our Islamic faith, you know, how we can turn to our faith to really propel us during these really um, difficult times. So, Safia, if you want to um, start. Yeah, of course. So um, my name is Safia Khan. Um, I'm a, a CBT therapist in my kind of main job. And then I also work with the spirit of minds to kind of help people from different communities to work on their mental health um so we're an organization that's been around for about well we we were running since 2014 and the kind of whole purpose of why it came about is because we felt like there was a big gap between muslims one even talking about mental health but also seeking support um and so we kind of created in spirit of minds as kind of like a one stop shop for kind of also education about mental health um through the workshops also like plugging material and putting stuff out there to kind of make it more um easy and open to talk about and then we also have our counseling team which we run and offer therapy for for within a slam perspective um so that's us that's brilliant i think it's really important to have platforms like inspirited minds so that people can reach out to you guys and speak about you know their mental health you know as I was researching about today's topic which is the cost of living crisis and the implications for our mental health around that you know a really shocking stat um you know came up which was that 66 percent of therapists say the cost of living concerns are causing a decline in people's mental health and as you are a therapist and you speak to different people of all walks of life have you really kind of faced that have you um touched on how the economic crisis is impacting people and their mental health yeah, I think it definitely has come up in a topic. I think a lot more people are scared mm-hmm. uh, and concerned because of the uncertainty of, you know, what is the winter going to look like? How is things going to be over the next, you know, six months plus? And I think where we've kind of come out of this COVID and everything is starting to kind of lift up again, it's kind of a bit of a dark curtain that's covered everyone. Um, I think there's definitely a lot of anxiety for sure. Yeah, I think there's been, you know, one thing mm-hmm. after another over the past few years, you know, as you mentioned with COVID um, and now with the economic crisis as well, it's just, you know, it's, it's really difficult. Mm-hmm. Um, another thing that I kind of looked at was that, you know, part of looking after our mental health is doing activities that make us feel good. You know, recently I have taken up running, you know, just trying my best. And I think it's really helped me with my mental health. Um, And one of the things that has come up is that with the cost of living crisis, a lot of people have started to cut back Mm. on activities that benefit their mental health, such as going to the gym or doing like an activity that they have to pay for. So I just wanted to kind of ask you, you know, why is it important to do really positive things that uplift us, but also if people can't afford to do the things that they love, is there anything that you could recommend or any kind of tips? Yeah, a, a really good question, actually, and great to hear that you're in run, into running. Yeah, Something I used to do and definitely need to get back into, but the winter months definitely don't help with the lovely weather we get here. So, yeah, give and take there. Um, I do think, um, yes, okay, it is definitely going to be challenging from a activity pers- perspective. I think a lot of the things that we normally enjoy doing do incorporate money, you know, whether it's going out for food or cinema or or seeing friends or family or like you said doing activity um, and it's actually really important one of the treatments that we offer for, for, for depression is actually 
behavior behavior activation mm. which is all about getting back into activity that you actually enjoy and one of the key things is about doing things that you kind of one give you a sense of achievement like running when you've yeah. had a decent run or actually also that kind of sense of pleasure the kind of the energy boost that you get from doing exercise I think we're very lucky uh, that we have the lovely internet where, where you can find loads and loads of videos of exercise videos that you can do online you can go outdoors and you know into the running's free for example though the uniform and the clothes might not be free but the, you know getting out and just running is completely free and I think also just kind of looking at alternatives of you know are there vouchers are there is it a case of just you know giving a call a friend friend a call or getting them to come over and have a cup of tea rather than going out somewhere or something along those lines and seeing about tweaking what we do to kind of save those pennies where we can't really I think that's a really good idea actually just thinking of ways that we can kind of do the same thing but in a different way and I think you know especially with the pandemic that really taught us just think keeping things simple um and just kind of going to your local park rather than going to the gym or you know as you mentioned going down a friend's house for tea that's like a you know a really good kind of idea as to how we can you know keep up with positive things with our mental health as well but you don't have to break the bank bank. yeah exactly so as i mentioned with the open kitchen Mm -hmm. um with muslim hands Tyra. I just wanted to ask about that as well. Um, yeah, go ahead. Just what you were saying about it kind of giving you the, the pleasure, that aspect of it as well. Um, I just wanted to ask as well kind of from the Islamic perspective, mm-hmm. um, just about really kind of stripping back because we can get very caught up in mm. um, a very fast-paced way of life. It's yep. a very kind of consumerist society. It's very individualistic. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just wanted to ask what lessons we can learn from kind of, kind of the the Sunnah and the Quran about slowing down and um, almost, you know, whether it's because we can't afford to keep up with it, mm-hmm. but actually could it be an opportunity that we can kind of take ourselves out of that um, and kind of just step back a few paces and, and reconnect um, with the world in, in maybe different ways now? Yeah. yeah so could I there think- be like a positive aspect of it for mental health? Definitely. I, th- I guess it's going to give us more time. To focus on our faith and I think actually that's one of the reasons why some something like in spirit and minds was created to actually make sure we're incorporating the faith and actually making sure that we come up as best, better Muslims when we are even doing the therapy um, and I do think one of the kind of key things about this is actually you know taking the time like you said to one learn more about our faith there's so many videos and making sure that we're using kind of reliable sources to kind of learn about our faith is really important and actually taking the time to you know you might have a bit more time to take your time when it comes to praying so one of the things that we really recommend is something known as mindfulness praying um, which is actually when you just take your time when you're doing your salah and actually noticing like the what your what your prayer mat feels like what the words you're saying what they actually mean all of those kind of different things and actually not just running through the pace of that high part high high pace kind of style of living that we have and actually just taking the time to enjoy the prayer and be with it so many times even I'm praying and I'm thinking about what I need to do afterwards or my mind's getting distracted and so many different things and just you know just taking your time to notice what you can hear what you can feel even what you can smell from the prayer mat and stuff it just really helps kind of home you kind of home you in and also calm down your anxiety really giving you that kind of feeling of comfort that actually I've taken this time to speak to Allah and ask for, uh, you know, ask for things from him and make du'a and hope for the best, really. So, definitely. Yeah, and I think that's really lovely, actually, because when you pray, um, you're having that conversation with God, so you feel like you're being listened to. But also, it's consistency as well, because, you know, we try and aim to pray five times a day, and that Mm -hmm. consistency every day does make you feel positive and you think that you know you feel like you've achieved something within that day when you hit those five prayers so I think that's really really lovely actually and just from the back of that you know one of the things that I do try to incorporate in my day is to listen to a really good kind of podcast you know Sunnah Stream is one of those but also you know um you know it could be um you know like Mufti Menk or Umar Suleiman just kind of listening to something really positive in the day that really kind of uplifts me so that I can be the best for the rest of the day as well so I think that's really important, you know, your faith, kind of incorporating that in your life and helping, um, you know, that kind of helping you to be more positive, mm-hmm. um, yeah, throughout the day. So um, I wanted to mention just about vulnerability mm-hmm. and, you know, with the economic crisis, a lot of us are feeling vulnerable, but there's 
more vulnerable people than others Mm. and our open kitchen really does touch that which is serving those that are experiencing homelessness or you know refugees or those that are experiencing domestic violence and our open kitchens are in Nottingham and in London and they've been running for um, a couple of years now and we serve over 450 meals a day um, Mm -hmm. and we also provide mental health support so I just wanted to kind of touch on you know in this economic crisis and everything that we've been going through you know which groups do you feel that are particularly more vulnerable like is that something that you can talk about a bit more yeah definitely I think when you're looking at across the board anyone of a low income already maybe anybody who's already struggling financially is going to definitely feel the crunch more and I think if you're looking at from an Islamic perspective there maybe is more of a focus on kind of those the men who kind of work especially when when mums are at home taking care of the kids and the kind of the stress are on how are we going to pay for things and a family in general I think also kind of the elderly mm-hmm. um, people who are on pensions or limited income as it as it is and how are we going to cope with these increased you know electricity bills that have been really scaring people um, and also students I think you know the young people who are actually just making out in the world starting university starting education looking for part-time work how are they coping with with paying for things really I think those are the, th- the main ones also, you know, single mums. Anyone who kind of is really, you know, potentially having to use the government to cope or is on not very high income is going to is gonna find it even harder this time around. Yeah, I think it's really interesting that you mentioned about, you know, putting food on the table because one of the things that came up during Ramadan, actually a piece of research from Islamic Relief, which was that an estimated 50% of Muslim UK households struggled um, to put food on the, li- uh, on the table and, you know, 18 percent of them um 18 percent of them are living in poverty yeah um and so they make up 18 percent of the of the population and so f- just to look at that stat that over 50 percent of the muslim population are really struggling to put food on the table that was in may and now the economic crisis is you know fast um mm-hmm. you know it's 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 growing yeah. um and so i cannot help but think what are those families going to be going through now you know what are their worries what are their concerns you know especially for their families and i mm-hmm. think you know having an open kitchen has really given us at muslim hands the opportunity to really kind of speak to those that are impacted and when you hear their stories there's so many things that you overlook like for example so many of them are reliant on breakfast clubs you know Mm -hmm. and when the pandemic hit a lot of them couldn't um you know provide for their families by giving them breakfast or lunch and so you know easter holidays where or or summer holidays or christmas holidays where those are meant to be times of fun and joy these families are really worrying about their kids and whether they're going to be able to feed them so in terms of vulnerability and all the groups that you mentioned you know how can we support the most vulnerable you know through muslim hands we have our open kitchen but with mental health is there any kind of and with your expertise how do you think that we can support those that are you know our most vulnerable during this time yeah, I think first of all, I think it's... Can it's, I just, sorry, yeah, up here, can I just, uh, just add to what Sarah was saying, actually, because that's a really interesting point. Um, and again, just bringing it back, I'm just trying to think of kind of the, the, the prophetic examples and where you've got, um, you know, even the prophet himself on the world, and, um, where he's really experiencing some really difficult times throughout mm-hmm. his life. I mean, like really heartbreaking grief, loss, um, all sorts of difficulties um and still kind of being there at every turn and supporting other people um and i guess you know if we're talking about particularly vulnerable groups um i just wanted to to know how um when you're feeling very vulnerable yourself and like sarah rightly pointed out i mean we are many of us are feeling really vulnerable and it's mm-hmm. a it's a massive crisis that is re- in real terms affecting our households in a, in a really worrying way um, how do you kind of um, muster up the, the faith and the strength um, and the compassion to, uh, I guess, be there for other people that might be even more vulnerable when you're not feeling that strong yourself? And then the other thing I, I kind of wanted to know off the back of that is, um, is that actually something that, that helps you? You know, if you're trying to support other people, is there like an element to that which is empowering for you with your struggling with your own mental health you're feeling particularly vulnerable yourself I'd be really interested to know your thoughts on that yeah I think those are really two key key questions and good questions there I think first of all there is it is hard especially if you're feeling vulnerable if you're feeling down if you can't even if you don't feel like getting out of bed to then get up and then 
go and you know take help out in a, a an open kitchen like yourselves or you know just do what you can for your community even if it's just a case of having a chat with your friend or you know giving them an open space to talk I think the important thing to remember is actually there are there is always going to be somebody worse off um I think if we rem- remind ourselves of other areas of the world where actually people don't even have you know protection over them from the rain or even have the food to or the opportunity to even have breakfast club just those kind of reminders of actually being grateful for what you have and focusing on the positives actually you know maybe I do have a roof over my head or I've got my loved ones around me and I've got the capacity and the ability to go and help others um I think is key and I think also um the point I was going to make is actually though it gives you a sense of purpose to go and give back to your community the the satisfying the good feeling that you get not that it should be a, not trying to make out to be a selfish thing but it does feel good when you go out and help somebody and actually it, like it puts things in perspectives you hear stories of other people in their lives and actually it kind of makes you think actually maybe I don't have things that bad or actually do you know what I've done this I've, I'm trying to do something good from here I'm doing a good deed here by giving back to the community and that in itself is really rewarding and satisfying to the heart I think like you said, the prophet was going through so many difficult times himself, and yet he still was very much there for his community. And I guess we have to kind of do the same, really. What yeah. was the second part of your question? Yeah. It's just gone out of my head. Yeah, no, I mean, I think that was pretty much it. I guess it is just this idea of um, of kind of, um, you know, when you're battling your own, for want of a better word, I don't like to use it, but demons, or you've got your own mm. mental health kind of issues, how do you, you pull yourself out of that to help people more kind of, positive impact that might have yeah because actually like like i said earlier one of the treatments for depression is actually about engaging yourself in activities getting yourself back on your feet slow and steady wins the race it's like you know when you're training for a marathon you don't start off with running 15 miles you start off with that half mile right and so it's just about getting up maybe having a phone call with one of your friends who's maybe a bit feeling a bit down or you know getting in touch with a local mosque and seeing what they can offer even as simple as like, you know, going online and Googling and seeing what volunteer options they are. It just gives you, you know, on Friday, I'm going to go to the kitchen, I'm going to help out there and I'm going to have a nice chat with somebody and it's going to get me out of bed for the day as well. So from that perspective and from an anxiety perspective, just gives you a distraction at the end of the day to kind of just stop thinking about your own worries and gives you a break from having to kind of carry those burdens really that we can feel very heavy on our shoulders. And I just wanted to add yeah, actually... Yeah, quite similar... Sorry, go on, Tara. I know you go to Jen, you go first. No, I was just going to say, I guess it's quite similar to the sense of purpose and routine um, that you guys were talking about earlier, you know, with prayer, I guess, as well. Mm. It's a very similar thing about immersing yourself in that and kind of almost taking your yourself and your, I guess, the, the burdens of this dunya kind of out of it and just immersing yourself in something that is rewarding and um, you know, inshallah, it kind of goes beyond beyond this world as well. Hundred um, percent. I think sometimes it's a reminder yeah. of actually, this is temporary. All of this is temporary. These worries, these concerns you have, you know, when you do pass, it's not going to be even a problem. So I guess it's focusing on the idea that this is a test. Allah puts put, puts the people most close to him in through a test to kind of get you closer to him. If anything, like I've gone from my own personal struggle, and for someone who's lived. I would say a fairly comfortable life to then go through a struggle it almost hit me a little bit and I was kind of a bit like whoa what's this what's this feeling why am I finding things so difficult to kind of cope but actually the reality is it's about getting closer to Allah and actually mm-hmm. building that connection with him really as well yeah and I think from a testing situation as well when you're put in you also realize how really you know how resilient you are and how yeah. strong you are but also, you know, that Allah is greater. Allah is greater than any problem that you're going to have. And I know that's easy said than done. But, you know, inshallah, there's always a rainbow after every dark cloud. And you'll see that, you know, you just have to persevere. And I think, you know, just from what you guys were saying that, um, you know, Islam teaches us to do acts that are consistent and but small Mm -hmm. and I think there's so much wisdom behind that like I think in this day and age we we really think that you know we need to kind of um have everything together you know we need to you know be at a certain level yeah exactly Exactly. and I think you know especially with this economic crisis as well you know a lot of people are really kind of maybe wanting to buy a home and couldn't because Mm -hmm. oh I can't get a mortgage or Mm -hmm. you know where am I going to be staying or you know there's I just feel like personally like this is the most uncertain time even you know in my whole history you know and I think for a lot of people they're saying that but I think you know 
is just to kind of putting things in perspective, you know, um, and, you know, people that have successful businesses, you know, they're now downsizing, you know, they're yep. thinking, well, can we even afford this mortgage or people struggling to find work, you know, so there's a, a real struggle. Um, and, you know, again, looking back at the projects that we do, you know, those that are already living below the poverty line are struggling even more. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I just think, you know, just try and have just just find something positive in your day to yeah, kind of focus continue on the, right fo try and focus on the positives not that it makes you bad to have the negative thoughts but actually mm. just kind of put it into perspective on the way here i was listening to the radio um and i was actually on tiktok the other day and i was scrolling through and i saw this live stream of these syrian syrian kids trying to like basically ask for money right yeah and i didn't really kind of yeah, make much sense awesome. of it yeah i didn't really make much sense of it i was like okay this loads of views this this live and i was like oh that's just, and i couldn't understand what the people were speaking because obviously it's a different language and then today listening on the radio that actually people are using tiktok to kind of beg for money and actually they're not even getting most of it anyway so there's this idea that even people in other parts of the world are having to use unique ways of mm -hmm. trying to get income really and it's mm -hmm. quite it's quite a, you would never think oh yeah why don't you you know we're so used to seeing people on the street but we never think of actually people donating via live, live stream that in itself is such a new and bizarre way to kind of get some money really yeah I mean we touched on homelessness yeah um and you know we touched on people wanting to buy their first home and not able to or people who already have homes and you know can't afford the mortgage so they're going to have to live somewhere else or people not even being able to afford the rent or people experiencing homelessness yep. so I just wanted to ask you know you you um speak to people from all walks of life um what you know what unique mental health challenges for people that are experiencing homeless or face homelessness do you think they're going through you you got to like I, I actually had a client that really came to mind when I when I saw that question come up because you've got to think about it from the perspective of imagine being taken out of your comfortable home even if it's like a little small bedroom and then being put outside with all your stuff mm. and then expecting to still put a smile on your place face to try and get work still try and kind of make your make your prayers like when I was reading into this a bit more from an Islam perspective there was people asking questions around you know can I still pray outside my car or how can I do 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 or can I shorten my prayers mm. so I can get through them so it's quite it's whenever I always think about a homeless person I always think about how am I going to help somebody kind of get better from their mental health if they don't even have like a house over their head yeah. they don't have a roof they don't have heating like um I had a gentleman I was treating who um was living at the the first time I ever treated him he was living out of a uh, not he was living out of a car um and I was trying to help him out from a mental health side of things offering therapy for depression just wasn't really working um and I don't know if you guys know from um Maslow, Maslow hierarchies of need if you guys know about no. the lovely triangle that you would have probably learned in business in school when you learn so you learn about this triangle of needs where Maslow says the minimal minimum one is like the bare necessity is mm. a house over your head um, and so actually until you have that nothing else is going to be really helpful so unfortunately this guy wasn't it wasn't it wasn't working the initial time and I actually had to refer him on because of his risk and his suicidal his suicidal thoughts mm. um and then he actually came back to me um a couple months later after he had been a bit more content contained and I'd been really pushing with the the housing association you can imagine this is pre-covid there's no there's no um housing like um council housing place that you can physically go to mm. you just got a ring 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 your phone until hope and someone picks up so I had this client and I was really trying to almost become a support worker not a therapist trying to get this person a house really uh, I kept pestering the housing housing association but I couldn't I couldn't help him anymore so I had to refer him on and then he actually came back and I, I restarted the therapy with him luckily he just happened to be reassigned to me um and at this point he had gotten put in a, to an apartment which really helped so alhamdulillah he was still working at the time he was just working from his car because his marriage broke down there was a lot more to it um, and I kind of worked. I did. I did. Um, did depression work with him again, looking at getting him back back on his feet, activity wise, and focusing on the things that were important to him. So his children were really important mm. to him, and actually focusing focusing on activities around his kids. And we found the second time round, it worked really well. Mm. He he was so much better by the end of it. And actually, he was thinking about going into mental health himself and mm. kind of helping other people because of his learned experiences. So it's just one of those things, like it's a whole extra ball game 
to not have a home over your head, living out of a car or not even knowing where to, you might even have a car. Where are you going to go? Yeah. So it's the idea of you have to kind of use your, like your homelessness shelters. You've There's a lot of, um, I can't remember the name. There's the shelter charity, which is really well known. There's always a lot of hostels or places that you can kind of go to for housing, but it's it's really difficult. But it just really shows the importance of having a home and what yeah. the home is a symbol of, you know. And um, I think, you know, we've had that. No, go, go for it. I was going to say, we, we've heard that from our open kitchen, you know, that stability that it gives for people to come to the premises and just have that hot meal and just yep. somebody to speak to and feel that warmth, you know, they love coming there. And so it just shows that, you know, home is really where the heart is. And without that that home, that, that stability, it's really difficult to function. And I think that's why, you know, a lot of people are feeling very anxious and uncertain during this time because yep. of that. Yeah, I was going to say, um, yeah, when myself and Tyra visited the, the open kitchen, it's kind of on the same yeah. point. Um, I think it probably stuck with us both. And it's just, it, you know, it's very interesting to, what you, what were you mentioning? Just can you say it again for us and our listeners, this, the um, chart that you the were talking Maslow about. The Maslow hierarchy of needs. I can't remember all of the areas off the top of my head, but it basically is a pyramid yeah. where you've got like your, your basic needs, which is stuff like house, food, um, you know, running water those kinds of things and then it moves on to kind of employment I think and then it gets to, so when you get to the top it's kind of more like uh like interest like art and kind of religiousness I guess mm. would be at the top so it's kind of points out yeah. and unless you've got the bottom bits the top bits just don't then although yes you you definitely still have your faith regardless whether you're homeless or not that security that you get from having a roof over your head nothing else really fits the fits yeah. the box yeah it's I like guess the, it's, it's just yeah it's like the foundation isn't it that's the foundation of your well, life without that yeah. everything else is going to like crumble so you definitely need that and yeah. you see it played out yeah. in, in like so many of these stories to do with homelessness mm-hmm. because you can see how um it's almost like a vicious cycle and you know you were talking about trying to get through to housing and things like that and i know it's like it's it's almost like such a cliche it's like a joke now like you know getting yeah. trapped in that system and getting nowhere um, and then you've got that vicious cycle. It's like, well, if I don't have a home, how am I supposed to get a job? Because I can't even, you know, like take a shower or have a yeah. shave or, you know, whatever you might need to do. Um, you know, it's it's kind of like the basis of getting your, your life back on track. Um, and so many people that we've spoken to that have dealt with homelessness at the open, open kitchen, um, it, it, you can't, it is that kind of that same narrative that plays out each time. Um and it, it really kind of does um, inhibit them in so many ways 100%. from in every area of their life. Um, and I guess that that's kind of uh, played out in the in the mental health way. Again, again, just bringing it back to that kind of, um, you know, example, you know, when you're talking about um, in the time um, of the Prophet, and, um, and you've got the way where you're kind of talking about the hijra, the immigration, and you've yeah. got where, um, you know, the Prophet himself and his whole kind of family, his followers are displaced. Yep. Um, and then it only took the kindness of, mm. you know, of the other to welcome them and to kind of give them that home. And I guess it's this idea as well, it's not just about, because I know you mentioned hostels where you've got this temporary accommodation. It's, you know, it's a basic, it's a roof over your head, but actually a home where you're kind of welcomed and mm-hmm. you don't feel like a burden. It's like you're there yep. as, as, as one of their own. Yep. It's, I guess it's a totally different effect on your mental well-being and your health and how, how you kind of interact with that as, as, yeah. it, as it is if you go somewhere and you're just kind of feeling a bit like a burden or you're feeling mm. a bit uncomfortable in that in that setting. 100%. Yeah. And I think also consistency as well, isn't it? Like mm-hmm. every day we have that routine, but then when you're living in accommodation that's temporary, you're worried about every day because the next day could change and the next day could mean I might be out of here. Yeah. So again, it's that as well, that kind of lack of consistency and routine in your life because, you know, you don't know where you're going to be staying. So that's that kind of so adds to that. It seems like so much Sorry, I was getting... like so much of what we're saying goes back to what you were talking about with uncertainty, right? Yeah. yeah. A lot of this is about just not having that kind of, you know, foundation of, of consistency or kind of certainty. 100%. And that's why um, it's so important to, to help the, if you see someone who appears to be homeless, give them some food, you know, a small act of, it could even be just like an apple or something, yeah. just to kind of help them out. Because 
at the end of the day, what else we need to be there to to support them as much as we can, really. I know sometimes there's this idea of, are they doing it? Are they actually, there's always that question of, you know, are they just doing this to get money? But actually, there's no harm in offering them some food. What What is that going to do? Just feeding someone at the end of the day. And I also so. think, you know, life always fluctuates and changes, you know. Yeah one day you're helping somebody and one day you will need the help and so when you're in that in that position that you can help somebody even as you mentioned just an apple or just saying hello to somebody or asking them how they are one day you're going to be you're you're going to need that as well you know and I think you know especially I've had you know the kind of privilege to travel and see the amazing work that Muslim Hands does across the world you know in Yemen and Somalia and when you travel there you just think wow this is you know extremely shocking what you see and you just think oh you know it's just in another country but I think since the pandemic you know difficult times can occur even in your back doorstep yeah um and you know I think the Ukraine war also showed that that you know a conflict in the west is possible and so I think for us it's just important to give when you can give and inshallah you know when you're in your time of need then inshallah somebody will be able to help you um as well and i think you know from the back of us talking about um you know uncertainty one of the main words that actually is coming up uh with the economic crisis is the is anxiety Mm -hmm. and six in ten people of you so six in ten of uk adults say that the cost of living crisis has had a negative impact on their mental health leaving them feeling anxious depressed or hopeless so you know anxiety is one of those words that is now circulating and Mm -hmm. um the question is what behaviors can people that struggle with anxiety adopt to help keep their worries at bay especially considering the current economic climate it's a good question i think a lot of people, when, when, whenever I'm working with a client with anxiety, I always like to remind them about how anxiety works, why mm. it exists. And actually, um, when I was reading into uh, like the Islamic side of things from, it, from an anxiety perspective, actually, it's mentioned in the Quran that we are going to be anxious people mm. because that's how Allah's made us. Yeah. And anxiety is, is essentially a safety net for your body to kind of remind you that you need to resolve a problem. Mm. So, understandably... Um, sorry, an, um, an economic crisis mm. is going to make us feel more anxious because our body is trying to prep us to say, hey, do something. something. Yeah. Be ready for this, basically. It's essentially something your body feels to remind you to do some problem solving, fix a problem. Now, the problem lies is when the anxiety is coming and you can't do anything about it, mm. something that hasn't happened yet. So, yeah, okay, we know that the bills might be going up and I'm sure a lot of us, maybe everybody noticed that, but actually we're not in the kind of the, the, deep, the deep of it yet. Mm. And so there is only so much you can do. And, and one of the things that I really try to remind my clients is actually, if you can't do anything about it, how much time are we spending worrying about something that we don't necessarily have control over? Yeah. Whether you're going to lose your job in the future. Okay, is that something that looks like it's going to happen? No. So, okay, let's pin that and have time to spend thinking about it in the day. Mm. So one of the things that we recommend is like having 30 minutes in the day to worry about these kind of what if, the, f- the kind of fun- future scenario worries. And then actually spending the rest of the day just trying to just refocus your attention back to whatever you were doing before that and just saying to yourself, I'll deal with that in my half an hour slot today, but I'm not entertaining it more than that. Because mm. it, it can feel like a bit of, it's so tiring. And I think that's really handy, worry, actually, so just tiring. kind of dedicating 30 minutes. So it's like, you, we're not saying ignore it completely. We're saying dedicate some time, but don't let it kind of... Um, feel, you know, infiltrate your whole day basically yeah. and, and ruin something that could be a productive um, and positive day. Yeah. Yeah, and I think actually... Yeah, that's really, that's mm. really interesting that you said that because I have to say from a personal perspective even, I do have a tendency to... One of the things... I'm a bit of a control freak sometimes. <laughs> My husband will attest to that. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things that I get really stressed out about is the things that... I can't actually do anything about Mm. Um, that's what stresses me out the most it's kind of like this self-fulfilling kind of prophecy because I'm just going around in circles Um, and I have to kind of remind myself like okay there is a plan you know like and I've got to kind of like try and um, kind of wean myself off constantly and it's funny because I mentioned it to a friend and I guess this ties in with what you were saying about calling friends and kind of talking to them and stuff she gave me a, it's a bit like what you're saying, but she, she's more, she's a bit more blunt. And she, the perspective she gave me was she just said, look, um, I just think 
uh, that for like tomorrow's decision or tomorrow's yeah. fire or tomorrow's stuff you have to worry about. Yeah. There's nothing that today's one can do about it. Mm. So yeah. why am I wasting my time? I'm leaving it to them. Let them worry about it. Understood. You know, like almost kind of like taking yourself out of it. Yeah. Um, uh, and I actually found that when she said that to me, it was funny because, you know, it, it's kind of common sense, but sometimes you, you just need like a friend to kind of put exactly. it a certain way. And, mm. Oh, okay, actually, you're right. I'm just yeah. being a bit of an idiot. Yeah. Why am I worrying about this yeah. so much? And one of the things I like to use my clients is the idea of kind of tying the camel, right? Just do what you can. Even with the practical exactly. problems, right? Because sometimes you can't resolve. You've got if you've got a pill, bill you need to pay and you can't, you haven't got the money right now, but you're working on it, but you're still worrying about it. You're working on it, but you worrying about it isn't helpful because no. you can't do anything about it. You're, you're doing what you can. Mm. So actually, just kind of sitting with the uncomfortableness, which is hard to do, but also just putting your trust in Allah and just saying, I've I've done what I can. I'm tying my camel and I'm moving on and just kind of leaving it up to Allah. And hopefully, inshallah, it works out for the best, right? And, and I think what's really interesting, what you guys have said is, you know, to Jenma, you mentioned that you spoke to a friend again, communication. It's yeah. really important to talk to someone. And as you mentioned, you know, tie your camel, um, you know, having that conversation with Allah that, you know, look, Allah, I've done my best. That's all I can do. And inshallah, yeah. you know, whatever happens next, I, you know, believe that it's good for me. Yeah. So I think communication is so important, especially during this time, you know, kind of speaking to your friends and your family, you know, so. if you're seeking therapy to speak to your therapist just because if you kind of keep your thoughts and your worries to yourself you know most likely you're kind of thinking you're thinking that a bigger problem than actually what they really are and it's mm. just important to you know if you have a problem to speak about it and kind of break it down because sometimes just with the support of a friend or a loved one can really kind of help alleviate your stresses and the situation that you're probably in so for example if you, you think that you can't you know pay a bill because you know I read you know online but you know a lot of people are not opening their bills are just really concerned but yeah. just kind of taking that first step of opening it and just kind of looking yeah. at it then speaking to potentially you know your service provider just I'm finding sure. out you know what what is my next steps if I'm not able to um, afford to pay the payments or whatever just being just talking about it and just yeah. not ignoring it is such an important thing so I think communication is really really important and I think sometimes we feel that oh if I communicate with somebody they're just going to think I don't have it together or whatever yeah. but I think it's important to just understand that you know everybody has issues we all are going through something but you know talk about it you know talking is just the best thing it's the best therapy so yeah I think you know from the back of everything yeah talking I was just going to say so with, with you mentioning that as well um just obviously because this is a bit of a sister's takeover of Sunna Stream, which I'm, I'm very excited about. We should call it a sister's Sunna Stream, I think. Yeah. <laughs> we changed the name. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to help you hear that. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think um, that you've got two things here. Just I'm thinking of what you're saying about communication. So you've got, um, I guess you kind of got unique problems um, for both because I know a lot of people talk about the fact that men often don't have the same kind of openness and open communication. They don't have the same support network. But, you know, alhamdulillah, sisters, we do really kind of, um, you know, rally around each other and we, we're always encouraged to be open. Mm -hmm. um, but then at the same time, I feel that, you know, for the ladies as well, um, we also have this expectation mm. uh, to kind of always hold it together. Yeah. yeah. Kind of evolve, you know, even from a young age as a woman, I feel, and especially like within a lot of, kind of um, the communities, you know, like Muslim communities, um, you know, it's a cultural thing, really. It's that cultural baggage of kind of your strength is kind of measured by the burdens you can carry yeah. and being resilient and kind of holding up the family. And even if, you know, um, and I don't want to, you know, I'm not making any accusations or anything, but even if the men in the family are lo yeah. losing the plot of it or maybe going a bit wayward, the boys are kind of misbehaving, you as the woman should always be there to kind of draw everything back and, make sure everyone is kind of okay and coming back around the table and you're really like the backbone of the, of the family um, and, you know, always on your best behaviour and always mm -hmm. being that, you know, strength in that, in that different kind of way. Um, so, so, yeah, it's just, um, it's kind of, I just, I just wanted to know, I guess, get your thoughts as well on when you put the living crisis into that, um, and the kind of extra burdens that it will have, like you mentioned, on mothers that are trying mm. to kind of take care of a household yep. or, yep. you know, these, these women that are kind of, 
you know, trying to soldier on and support the household. You know, it might be, you know, God forbid, husbands that have lost jobs or brothers or fathers or, you know, people that are struggling as well that they're trying to be there for. Um, I just wondered if you had any specific kind of insights or advice you could give for the sisters that are just trying to soldier on through and bear that burden and kind of look after everybody else? Yeah, I definitely think one of the key things is having that self-care, like having that time to yourself. I think as a mum, as a wife, um, being a, you know, a, a daughter or a sister, I think you, you take on a lot of responsibilities as you might do being a man, but it's different being a female. Like you mentioned, there's that kind of a bit more of a different kind of responsibility and emotional responsibility, I guess you can say from that aspect. And I think it's definitely important to have your self-care. So having your time to kind of switch off and just be you as a person, I think is really key. And I think having your time to pray, making sure that, you know, you have that kind of, um, kind of that security with your husband, with your family to kind of be able to have that time for you to have yourself be able to focus on your prayer and focus on your religion and I think also just realizing that you're not going to be able to fix everything and that it's okay because I think a lot of the times we're, we're here as the problem solvers aren't we but actually sometimes there isn't always an answer and actually that being okay it's really interesting because um, in my time of therapy I've seen way more women than I have men um, mm. and I think there's more of a willingness or kind of an acceptance of needing support as a woman so also just reaching out for therapy for you if you are finding things too much as well and just having a chat or having a chat with a friend to be able to just kind of express how you're feeling just getting it off your chest can be really helpful um and just knowing that you're not alone and I think it's really important what you said about you know your self-care because if you're not at your best self what are you able to give yeah if your cup is empty who are you going to pour into yeah so I think it's really important to look after yourself and, and always remember that you know it starts with yourself and if you're not investing in yourself you can't invest in other people and I think also just being realistic you know you can't do everything you know I think possible. yeah like I know with my mum she you know five kids you know she never said no and I'm sometimes I'm like mom you can say no like if you can't do it just say no it's mm. fine and I think sometimes just being realistic with your boundaries and just saying look I just can't do this I think it's really important as well for yeah. your mental health as well because I think with the economic crisis as well you know whether you're a working mom or not you know you run the household you know yeah. and you know just trying to make things you know ends meet and just making sure that everybody's happy you know even exactly. when I went um to Yemen and Somalia you know you even see there the power of the mother mm. the mother is the one keeping the home together the mother yeah. is the one looking after the children and yeah. a lot of these mums are the ones that are single mums head of the yeah. household you know and they're keeping it together for their children and so you know it's just you know mothers you know alhamdulillah women are you know miraculous with what you know they kind of carry and so I think it's really important that you know we always remember that there's only so much we can do and that you 100%. know we have to have you know our kind of boundaries I think that's really important to um and not feel guilty about exactly it yeah exactly not feeling yeah, I guilty. think that's one thing especially for mums like myself as a mother as well I've had to really kind of come to terms with that and I've yeah. struggled because you do kind of feel like you always got that kind of guilt of, you know and it, it's not just for mums it's women in general as well you feel that you kind of should be succeeding on all fronts and being there for everyone um, and I think sometimes as well, um, you know, even in terms of leaning on your husband more, mm. because sometimes we assume that your your husband might not be, um, you know, if you are if you are struggling, um, sometimes we don't ask our husbands, we don't want to burden yeah. our husbands, or we think that they're not going to be responsive. But actually, if you're willing to let go a little bit um, mm. of things and let your husband even take over on certain things, or you know, it, mm. support in that way especially if the two of you are working, there's no shame in that. Um, and then you might actually find that, um, you know, depending on, you know, when you approach um, your husband in that way, you know, everyone wants to, to, to help and to feel needed and to know that they can support the people that they love. So there's no reason why then, if you seek that from them, why, why they would, wouldn't, you know, kind of be happy to help. I, I had to let go a little bit with my husband as well and just let him into kind of, especially with the children, Mm. support more as my work got more hectic and things um but once I did I just thought why have I been you know running myself ragged and yeah. you know with the cost of living crisis unfortunately you know it's even more stress so mm. you need to kind of share that burden um even more you know within your household as well as with other 
kind of women outside. Yeah, I was going to say actually from the back of that, do you have you had couples come in and kind of talk about you know kind of sharing responsibilities or things like that or not really? Um, we do get clients who come in for couples work. Mm-hmm. So um, in the, in the spirit of minds, it's something we're introducing. We haven't fully got up and running, yeah. but it's something we're going to be definitely offer, definitely offering in the next couple of weeks. And it it does does come down to communication. I think yeah. sometimes there is that kind of just lack of just letting somebody know how you're feeling, especially I think you can look at it from the woman's perspective, imagine it from the guy's perspective. How am I going to tell my wife I'm feeling depressed? Yeah. Like, how's that even going to come up? I'm supposed to be yeah. guy, I'm supposed yeah. to be taking care of her. Like, it's such a difficult topic to even talk yeah. about. And then what is my wife going to say in response to that? How yeah. is she going to take that on board? Yeah. Um, so definitely communication is key. And I think also working on things together, like, right? So you're going to do, you're looking at increasing your activities, for example, do something together and I think especially being you know if you have children it's so hard you you can so easily lose that husband and wife relationship and just mm. become mum and dad mm. and it's so important to just have that that identity as yourself. a couple yeah. right and just to say you know just to remember that that you know you're still husband and wife and you still want to yeah. kind of spend that time you know um, like maybe you know I'm going to stay up okay we're really tired let's just stay up and watch a program for a bit or watch a video about Islam together and, and marriage and stuff like yeah. that you know what I mean like just it's an extra 20 minutes yeah you might be lacking your sleep and you know, obviously I, I don't have kids so it's probably quite easy for me to say him be like ah don't worry about your sleep just spend a little bit of time together but actually it's so important for your marriage to to also have that I think and that's one thing yeah, I see yeah. a lot a lot so much even if I I'm only seeing the wife or the husband so many times I've seen like it's just a case of not spending enough time together and not really expressing to each other how they're really feeling yeah. either. Yeah, I just think, you know, that commu- communication, I think that's coming back up again. Communication is so important. So um, we were talking about mental health and we're talking about, you know, our Islamic faith. So what does the Quran and Sunnah teach us about our mental health, um, both our own and the health of others? Yeah, so I think if you think about why Inspirited Minds was created, there was such a stigma and there is such a, such a stigma to even I recognise as mental health as being something that you need to work on and maintain. Mm. Um, and then when you look into the Quran and the Hadiths and stuff out there and actually the Prophet's own experiences of sadness and depression or anxiety, you can't really say it doesn't exist, really and truly, when it comes down to the personal experiences of people mm. all the way back then in time, you know? Even to this day, they're still experiencing the same thing. Um, so why are we trying to kind of stop people from being able to recognize themselves as having depression and anxiety um in the in the quran it talks a lot about being grateful um for what you have and it kind of comes down to that kind of focusing more on the positives and actually when you look at the western therapy one of the things that we work on is actually changing our thoughts changing the type of thoughts we're having and switching them to a more positive Mm. more realistic perspective and that very much links to what's found in the Quran it also talks a lot about spending time with Allah um, making dua to him asking him to kind of you know help you and actually recognizing this idea of you know this is my potentially my test Mm. I need to just kind of work through this use the support around me Um, and one of the other really interesting things I found was actually you know Allah created all of these diseases that we have on this on this earth right so he's essentially creates a depression anxiety if you put it into kind of that perspective so the idea is that actually we know that he also wants us to seek out the right medication mm. the right support so why are we why are we not doing that from a yeah. mental health perspective if, we, if i broke my leg i would go to the doctors and get a cast and put crutches on and i would go and you know heal myself but actually why am i not talking to a therapist or taking some medication if it's going to help me be a better muslim and also be a better version of me yeah and make me feel happier in life and i think i've read somewhere don't quote me on it but you know it was from uh, like our, our faith just the encouragement of if you had to be alone or if you had to be part of a community it's better to be part of the community and yeah. intermingle with um you know with your community and there's a exactly. there's a wisdom behind that you know because when you intermingle and you talk to people you do have this kind of feel good you know you're talking to people mm-hmm. you know there's this kind of positive element to it so um so yeah no i, I agree that it's really important for us to again communicate and you know not kind of lock ourselves away because again we overthink and we think that our problems are a lot bigger than you know um what they are and Uh, also if you don't know how to respond to your daughter or son or brother or sister or husband or wife expressing difficulties with mental health Mm. educate yourself 
we talk a lot about educating ourselves about the Quran and Hadith. Educate yourself about mental health. You, yeah. We all know about diabetes and cancer and all this stuff. Actually, what do we know about depression and anxiety? Yeah. And it should be up there. Yeah, no, I totally agree. That's so true. And I guess it goes hand in hand um, because, you know, the Islamic approach to health is very holistic. Exactly. It's not about looking at anything in isolation. And, you know, your mind and your body are connected. Um, and so, you know, to kind of isolate and to just say, oh, no, we're just focusing on this or, oh, no, this is not connected to this. It's kind of, you know, even the, the kind of history of Islamic kind of medicine and system, you know, like okay. the different kind of... Um, our traditions, they're never looking kind of in isolation at anything. The, the mental well-being is always very connected to physical well-being. 100%. And so, yeah, I think it, it makes it makes sense, doesn't it, um, that, that we kind of look at that and um, kind of allow ourselves to, to kind of explore that and be open to that. And Okay, so one of the other questions is, what services are out there to help people manage their anxiety around money management or where can people seek free support any or any practical support? Yeah, so from a mental health perspective, you obviously have um, a spirit of mind to offer charity, yeah. uh, counselling, sorry, shall I say, and we also do CBT therapy, so it's not just a counselling approach. but also So can I just ask, what is yeah. CBT therapy, if you can just yes. quickly break it down uh, to the audience, just in yeah, case I'm so somebody, li- yeah, no, yeah, because you're the expert, yeah. but if there's anybody interested in, yeah. you know, wanting to find out a bit more, just briefly, if you can just kind of differ... Yeah. So CBT is all about looking at how your thoughts, your behaviours, your physical symptoms and your emotions are all interconnected. So if I'm having negative thoughts, I'm going to be feeling physically down um, and drained. My emotions are going to be very low and so I'm not going to do much. And so it looks at changing the thoughts and the behaviours. It's quite an active therapy. It's all about kind of getting you back on your feet. It's quite um, not your typical let's lie down on a couch and have a talk about it. There's always things for you to go away and practice and like skills to learn. Um, a counselling approach is is more about kind of processing and coming to terms and kind of talking through mm-hmm. things. To be honest, a lot of counsellors also have CBT components, so it's, there's always a bit of a mishmash, and with CBT there's always an element of talking through things as well, so it, it can be mixed, um, but that's kind of the crux of it. I think when it comes to um, offering support, like I said, you have got Inspirited Minds, which has its own Islamic therapy um, for people who prefer, would prefer that. Sometimes people just want a, a therapist who looks like them or is of the same faith as them. Yeah. Some people wanna, want to also improve their faith through, mm-hmm. through the therapy itself. So it kind of depends on the preference. You also have your local NHS talking therapies, which is completely free. Um, yes, okay, sometimes the waiting list can be long, but they can be worth the wait because yeah. you're getting the support that you need and it's completely free. Um, you, there's also, um, what was the other one I was going to say? It's gone out of my head. Um, in terms of practical support, your your best bet is going to your local council and looking at like citizens' advice. A lot of places have like, um, like a home and money hub or like a financial difficulties place mm-hmm. and there's a lot of helplines out there at the moment who can give you advice about are you eligible for a grant here or how can you work on reducing your um your energy bills and all those kinds of bits and bobs there's a lot of there a lot of that stuff out there um i think there are a, there's a lot of content on our website around kind of working working on your mental health there's a lot of questions that are answered on there um, and we do have a lot of like uh, workshops that we run around DV communication and families. Mm-hmm. We have a workshop on that. We have one around religious OCD. Um, I, I think it's just about just trying to put yourself out there, speaking to a counsellor, speaking to a GP. Um, most people think they have to go to GP to get therapy, but actually now you can literally just go straight to the website and fill in a form and get get an assessment straight away. So it's not a case of making that long-winded GP appointment mm. which sometimes is really hard to get you we've kind of cut that out now um what else? I think those are the kind of key things and also it sounds like you guys have a, re- a really good setup at, at um Muslim hands with the open kitchen yeah yeah so we do there. hold fortnightly mental health support sessions for our beneficiaries which has been received really well um and I think it's great that you mentioned about um you know, if people can't afford to pay for counselling because it is quite pricey, yep. you know, that there are areas where people can go. So you've mentioned the Inspirited Minds website. You yep. said the NHS web- website. You can go to your local doctor potentially and just kind of speak to them about wanting to seek therapy and what's yep. the best way to kind of go about it. 
Um, and also you mentioned the council website as yeah. well. So you can kind of look on there just to see, um, you know, what options there are. Um, I wanted to ask a question actually that came into my mind. You don't have to answer it if you don't want okay. to. But, you know, we're obviously talking about the economic crisis and, you know, people kind of struggling and worrying about certain things and doing cutbacks. Have you already started thinking about cutbacks in your own personal lives or has that not, re have you not really felt it just yet because I know you live um Sophia and then one of the most expensive places in the world London so you know yeah. and I know Tejan used to live in London um but she now lives in sunny Cyprus so yeah like I, have you guys started thinking about it's really expensive here right now as well <laughs> is it well, okay. really it's global oh um, god can't get away from, I mean it's not as bad as London but um you know it's still pretty tough people are struggling so wherever you go I think yeah yeah so I'm one of the lucky ladies who still lives at home with their parents. Um, yeah. So it definitely has come to my mind, though, because I actually contribute. I pay for the, the food, yeah. bill, food, food bill. Oh, for God, my food bill. Yeah, oh, it's just week. extortionate. Yeah. I was just saying to one of my colleagues today, actually, you pick up three items and you're eight pounds and you're thinking eight pounds for yep. just three little things it's crazy yep. yeah I definitely feel it in the in the shopping when I'm doing my shops like I can't really just yeah. pop in. Yeah, that's that definitely I not. felt and petrol. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I have my, my car's 20 years old. That's my first ever car and I still have it. I used to put 30 pounds in there <laughs> and it's 60 pounds now. I'm like, wow. Yeah, times yeah times 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 Yeah. I do think like. Even basic. Yeah. Like, like bread and yeah. eggs. It's like. That's it's all very saying. well telling people to, yeah, stop eating avocados or getting barista coffee. But, you know, when the loaf of bread has, you know, gone up double, you know, yeah. your eggs and your basic 100%. things. That's what it's I was really going to say. Difficult. Like I've noticed that going food shopping, and I never thought I would be that b bothered by this, the price of cucumber or the price of bread. But actually, you got to save yeah. your pennies where you can. Yeah. So it's being selective about: do I really need that bar of chocolate right now? Yeah. Really, just I thinking about it, right? It. Yeah. You're just kind of thinking, oh my goodness, like, do we? You know, that is really expensive, and really yeah. kind of. I think you know, in, in terms of my life, it's the first time I'm really thinking about wow that's expensive and kind of thinking about the whole budgeting and yeah. you know just kind of being more mindful as well and actually one of the things that I was really kind of looking at was kind of um you know people are doing you know just kind of reading about actually what kind of tips can you do to exactly. save money and you know people have no spend months which I think is quite a fun wow. challenge I mean you know if you can do that by really kind of looking at things you don't really need yeah, yeah. I think there's a difference between the need and the want but yeah, yeah you know there's always ways to um you know kind of cut back on those pennies really but um yeah no I think it's really interesting that you know we've all kind of felt you know some sort of kind of um anxiety well, yeah just something about we we have all thought about you know how, how this, is this gonna look? yeah yeah how the economic crisis is really kind of impacting us and how we felt it yeah um so thank I you think so, the yeah. on all of us 100 so I'm just going to say on that yeah. point as well um the onus is on all of us as well you know, it's affecting us to, to raise awareness, yeah. you know, as human beings and as Muslims as well, we should be um, kind of active in, in trying to kind of be a voice for ourselves and for the, our communities as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you've got so much stigma and, you know, which has not helped with, I won't name any names, um, but, you know, certain media outlets and things. Yeah. Um, that kind of um, perpetrates the stigma around, you know, whether it's homelessness, mm -hmm. whether it's people attending food banks, whether it's, you know, we even get the open kitchens, you know, Syra will attest to this because you've had so much difficulty just trying to get people to share their stories. Yeah. And you think, why would you feel, you know, ashamed or embarrassed to, to kind of to share that story? Um, but, you know, you see the effects of these very toxic kind of... Um, these toxic kind of um, assumptions yeah. that are made about people and things. Um, and I think, you know, um, like Sari, you said earlier, any one of us has been in that situation. Yeah. So I think mm. a lot of it as well is about us raising awareness to say, you know, yeah, basic food prices have gone up. So people need to use food banks. That's, you know, that's what they need to do and to challenge people that, you know, we come across these kind of, harmful stereotypes or you know mm. things that are being propagated to challenge that and to say well actually um you know that that's not that's not right or you know you're judging or um, yeah and I can just you know, you know because, yeah I just want to echo to Jen what you mentioned about 
you know, people finding it really difficult to kind of talk about, you know, that they're struggling because, again, from the Islamic relief um, research, that 50% of Muslims, you know, couldn't put food on the table during Ramadan was so shocking for me because, you know, ethnic minorities don't really want to talk about their issues, especially, you know, Muslims. Like, we don't, we, we, you know, we're we're very guarded about what we share. And when I, you know, read that, I was like, wow, that is just upset like that was shocking to me Same. you know we live in the uk and 50 percent of muslims are not able to put food on their table and you we know? love we love our ramadan if and we love like, our ramadan we're very we hospitable people yeah. you know we're very <laughs> hospitable we're very giving especially <laughs> like during eid you know food is central to our lives 100%. you know we're foodies you know um and you know not being yeah, able yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah not being able to fulfill that you know i can just imagine those families just feeling this level of like inadequacy just not being able to provide for their children you know so I think you know as I mentioned I know it's not easy but it's just so important for us to share like what we're going through because food banks are on the rise that you know in in their record high you know that people are needing to use it because people are struggling and I just want for anybody listening and anybody struggling like I just want you guys to know that you're not on your own you know there's so many people in the similar boat I think we're all struggling in some way shape or form some more than others but you know it's just really important to kind of talk about it and this is why we're doing this today because we just want people to kind of we just want to be raw and honest you know we might not be you know hard hit but everybody's thinking about it everybody's thinking about you know these are the you know this is upcoming you know this winter is going to be you know I've been saying are are lights going to be out this this Christmas are people going to even put the lights on you know like what's going to be happening is it going to be like a different kind of atmosphere you know this winter but you know all of us are kind of thinking of it in the back of our minds you know what is to come but I think Mm -hmm. it's just really important to communicate like always be around with your loved ones and um you know just share how you're thinking but also there's so many free Um, services and platforms that are there ready to help you so you're not alone like you know don't sit in silence and I think that's the kind of important core message so Safi I just wanted to ask is there any kind of final things that you kind of want to say before we wrap up I think for me the key thing is is if you're struggling with your mental health just just come and talk to somebody whether it be Mm. your mom whether it be your local GP whoever it might be in spirit of minds just come and give us a shout even if you feel like Maybe you're not as unwell as maybe somebody else. It doesn't matter. The point of the, the fact of the matter is if you're feeling down, anxious, whatever's going on for you, there is always support out there for you. You don't have to be alone. Yeah. And so you mentioned about free support. So you've said the Inspirited Minds website. We're going to put that in the little kind of description box. Um, yep. You also mentioned about NHS. Just go on the NHS website. and You can kind of look at that. You mentioned mm-hmm. your local doctor. Go to your GP and kind of find out what services there are out are, are, there are out there that are free and also the council website as well again more services as well and to jen is there any kind of final things that you want to say before we wrap up um no i just wanted to say thank you so much to both of you i've and um, this is my first podcast that i was part of I've, I've really enjoyed it and thank you so much for also traveling especially talking about petrol prices for traveling all this way to <laughs> to be with us and i guess um just to say as well, um, for people that kind of want um, support, you know, to do with maybe like food poverty, food insecurity, homelessness, or they just want to come and, you know, have like a nice hot meal with, you know, um, with no judgment in a nice warm space. If you're based um, in London, um, then we've got the Hounslow Open Kitchen, which is on Great West Road. Um, if you're based in Nottingham, um then you can come to Mansfield Road. Um, we're there. You can check us out on um, the Muslim Hands website. Um, we'll also, you can also find us on social media. Um, and just to say, you know, that, that everybody is welcome. Um, and just for, for anyone who is thinking about, um, you know, how they, they might want to support their local community, um, you know, we, we do take... Um, um, in-kind donations we do encourage volunteers and we also have um kind of regular giving that you can set up even just giving a small amount uh, to support people coming into the open kitchen yeah no that's that's um yeah if you want any more kind of information on the open kitchen go on our website muslimhands.org.uk or you can give us a call on zero double one five nine double one seven triple two just to get a bit more information but thank you guys thanks <laughs> You're listening to Sunless Dream, a podcast exploring the prophetic way.